So hello everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Gergely Rivoy. Um, I'm a I'm a penetration tester. Uh, yeah, I'm original from Hungary, and uh, I know the title is a little bit boring, uh, but I hope uh, the presentation will not be as boring as the title. So uh, let's begin. Uh, I will suggest a game first. Uh, this is a drinking game. Uh, if you have alcoholic beverages with you then I dare you to drink uh, all the time when I say request during the presentation. I will, I will talk about uh, web things, so it will happen quite a few times. If you don't have alcohol, just drink water and imagine how drunk you would, would you be at the end. I can assure you, you would be hammered. So uh, let's get on with it. Um, this is the agenda of the presentation. So I will call the cross-origin resource sharing uh, course because it's too long for me. Uh, I can't talk that, that much. First, I will talk a little bit what it is at all. Um, probably some of you already know it, uh, but probably some of you don't. So I will explain what it is and how it works. And, uh, and after that, I will go back a bit uh, in time to talk about uh, what, was, uh, what kind of solutions were used instead of course when it didn't, exi when it di didn't exist. Uh, then, since we are talking about attack attacks, I will try to like, define a little bit the attacker. Um, then we go into the problem, what's the problem there? And at the end, I will s uh, show a few ideas how you can use this thing uh, in uh, web application attacks. Then, to be a little bit um, constructive, I will try to give some, uh, some hints for solutions to, to, avoid, to avoid these kind of attacks. And uh, I have some demos for the, uh, for the end uh, that I want to show you. Uh, yeah. So, what is Quartz? Uh, yeah, as the picture suggests, it's, uh, it's an HTML5 feature. Uh, the whole idea of it is to be able to uh, load uh, resources from other domains. Uh, this is how roughly the architecture looks like. It's not that difficult. Actually, course is also not that difficult. Um, normally, when you, when you have an application and you want to access another domain, uh, it's limited by the same origin policy. That was the original thing. And uh, course in HTML5 uh, came to came to change this because because there was a business requ requirement for that. So, for instance, if you if you run an application, you have your 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 business logic, the application itself, in one domain, but you uh, you want to store your resources like pictures or videos or whatever in another domain, like uh, in a storage uh, or something like that, and uh, and you want to download these resources with JavaScript. So on the client side. Uh, originally, it was not possible because of the same origin policy, because, because uh, from JavaScript you couldn't go to, to other domains, uh, because the same origin policy stopped, stops that. And, um, but since there was a requirement, uh, the course came. The course was defined and implemented. But before course, when people figured out that they want to do something like this, uh, of course, the clever developers started to, to, to implement some some kind of alternatives, how they can manage this. Um, most of them were kind of hacks. They worked, but they were not really, uh, not really good. Uh, one example is to do proxying on the server side. So when you, when you try to download the resource, then you will go to a proxy first, and the proxy actually will uh, send you to the other domain. Um, or the JSONP, uh, it's JSON with padding. That's, that's what the... That's what the, the call snippet is here. This is JSONP. Because since you couldn't send a request from JavaScript, so I'm talk, when I say JavaScript, I'm talking about the XML HTTP request of JavaScript. Um, so you couldn't send XML HTTP requests to other domains. But what people figured out that, that if you want to load uh, JavaScript, you can load JavaScript from other domains. So if you use the, the source uh, attribute of the script tag, then the browser will actually send the request to that URL, normally to download the JavaScript. But the people started to, to use it uh, in a funny way. For instance, if you, look at, if you look here, you can see that this is like uh, some kind of API here. We are talking about users, 
And this is some kind of user ID. And usually, in this case, usually there is a there is a callback function defined. The callback function here is the parse response. And what it happens that when you load this script tag, there will be a request sent to this URL, and the server will will uh, take this data as actually the part of the parameters of the request, and uh, it will process it, and you get back the get back the the response data, wrapped around your defined um, callback function. And since this whole thing happened in a script tag, uh, and the parse, parse response function is defined on the client side, so it exists in your JavaScript code, then the script, uh, the browser will execute it immediately when you got back the response. Um, I think you feel it as well that it's, it's not really a, a nice uh, implementation, but it worked. Um, but everybody figured that it's not so nice, so so that's why uh, cores uh, was, was uh, specified and then implemented in browsers with the HTML, uh, HTML5 uh, feature set. So um, how cores really works? Um, we define two kind of requests here. The, name is, the naming is pretty stupid because, because there are not really good names for that, but we will define simple requests and not so simple requests. Um, and the browser will have to make a decision whether the, the request, again, this is an XML HTTP request, whether the request is a simple request or, or not. But how does it make the decision? Uh, the trick is there that a simple request is very strictly defined. A si simple request can be only a head, a get, or a post with these, uh, these, these four headers and it, with these content types. Anything else is not a simple request. That's, that's the definition. Um, so first, when you, when you define a, an XML HTTP request object, uh, you create your request, and when you, click, uh, when, you, when you execute send, then the browser will look at your request and uh, check out these uh, things. And if your request complies with these rules, so it's, for instance, a get with, uh, with these headers and with these yeah, then content type, it's something interesting. So with these headers, then, then the browser will say, oh cool, this is, just a, this is just a simple request. Then I can send it immediately. That's how it happens for a simple request. But if it turns out that your request was not simple, for example, it was a put, or, or it had a, a funny HTTP header, or a funny content type, then the browser will see it and then Okay, sorry, this is not a simple request, so what should we do? And what it does, uh, you, can, you can see here, is to send a pre fight request. In the next slide, I will show an example of what a pre fight request is, but just to get the idea, you, you execute send, the browser here sees that it's, this is not a simple request, then he sends a pre fight request, which is actually asking the server whether this kind of request is allowed or not. And the server will respond, respond with the prefied response, telling the server, uh, telling the client, the browser, whether this kind of request is allowed or not. And when the browser says, "Okay, cool, the server allows this request," then I can just send it, and then everything happens as normally. So your original request will be sent. But if your your request is not allowed by the server, then the browser will just drop your request. It it will not happen. It will not be sent. Uh, yeah, this is a pre fight request. It's, um, it's, always a, it's always an options request. And uh, what, what's important for us in course is access control uh, headers. For instance, in the, in the origin header. When you send an XML HTTP request, there will be an origin header telling the server where is this uh, request coming from. It will be really important for us. And, uh, and since this request was uh, was not a simple request. We can see here from this pre fight request that it was a put request because it asked the, the server whether put requests are, allow, are allowed or not. And there it had, a, it had this uh, funny um, header, this X custom header. And yeah, the, the server will receive this request. And this, if course is configured properly, then he will send back uh, the pre fight response uh, simply telling the browsers that this origin is allowed, these kind of methods are allowed, and this header is allowed. And if the browser sees that 
that everything is allowed what the, uh, what the JavaScript asked for, then he will send the request. So for instance, this, uh, the, the original request here is allowed because put is allowed and the header is allowed, so it can go on. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much course. Uh, we, sorry? Again, sorry, I didn't hear. Because your ser service works that way. If you, if, you, if you work with the REST API, you probably want to send put requests or, or delete requests because REST uses it. Uh, so if you want to, it depends on the service. It, it's not always that it's your service. It might be another service, what you just use. Uh, so it's, it's not up to you whether, uh, what kind of methods. But to be honest, a simple request is, is, um, is pretty strict, I think. Uh, so it, they are really simple. So as, as soon as you want to do something complicated, you will somehow start to use that simple request. So um, the attacker, I will call him Neo, just for no reason. Um, this, is, this is a basic like, client-side attack architecture. So the attacker comes, he compromises a server somewhere, uh, like a watering hole or something, and, um, and tricks the user or waits, to, waits for the user to go there, download, the, the, download his malicious code, and then if the user, oh sorry, if the user is in an internal network, then, then, um, then the code will be executed here, so the attacker can either uh, try to attack internal targets or external targets. Uh, so what kind of attackers we are dealing, dealing here? I will actually just ask questions here just to know that there are different kind of, kind of attackers with different goals. So what kind of uh, knowledge the attacker has? I, was, I am a bit confusing here because when I say internal and external here, I mean that it's uh, whether the attacker knows the system what he's attacking or not. So uh, when I say internal, it means that the, the attacker has a dedicated target to attack. attack. So you can, you can imagine that it's an ex-employee and he knows that there is some, there is some application running in the, in the internal network and he wants to attack that application, but he doesn't have access to the network anymore because he's an ex-employee. Or he can be an external attacker, an attacker without knowledge, and, uh, and then he might use cores just to infiltrate the network, to, to look around, to see what kind of services are there, things like that. That's, how I, that's why I said that I was confusing, because now I'm talking about the location, whether the attacker sits inside the network or not. So he's either a local attacker in the same network where the target is, or a remote attacker coming, coming, coming from outside and try to get access somehow. Um, and again, the goals. You can imagine plenty of different goals what an, what an attacker wants to do. One could be, I've already said these things, uh, to, to just get somehow access to the whole network, not to attack something just to get access, uh, to, to attack the services in the internal network, or just simply steal data through this user. But how he does it? Yeah, so here you can see why I didn't go into the photoshopping industry, because I'm not really good at it. Um, but what I wanted to show here is that the essential problem with course is that it breaks the same, same origin policy a little bit. Not really, so it's, it's not like, so course is not a broken feature. It's not like it's, it's not vulnerable, it's not, it's not totally broken, it's a well-defined feature and it works how it works, but if it's not configured well, then you can use it uh, to attack. And the problem is that people were trusting the same origin policy and this, is, this, this was something which I wasn't expecting to happen that you can just go around a little bit. So that's a problem, that's what we are gonna use. And again, course is just a tool. It's, uh, it's not insecure, it's just a tool in the inventory of the attacker. So he can use this tool to, to make uh, more complex attacks. Um, and yeah, let's see the attacks. Uh, I assume some of you know the cross-site uh, cross um, request forgery as uh, like a set of uh, attacks. But I will just uh, explain a little bit about that because, because that's, that's where course is really relevant. 
So uh, the, the, I would call it C-surf because that's again a long stuff. So C-surf is a kind of vulnerability when uh, you exploit the fact that, that uh, whenever you send a request to a domain in the browser, the browser will attach the cookies to, to that request automatically. That's how the session cookies or the HTTP authorization headers, this will be attached automatically. And if you imagine that, that you are the user and you are logged in here in Facebook, you have, you have uh, actual session cookies right now for Facebook. And if Facebook would be vulnerable to CSERF, I think it is not, but let's assume if Facebook would be vulnerable, then the attacker could just implement here on the malicious server uh, a form, uh, like a hidden form, to, to update your status, or yeah, so post on your wall or something. And when the, the, bros the user comes here and loads this page and sub submits somehow this hidden form, uh, then the browser will send this request to Facebook because, it's, because the form says it, it should go to Facebook. And since the browser has already has cookies to facebook.com, that the cookies will be attached to this request. And that means that it goes in to Facebook and Facebook, the Facebook will never know that where it came from or it never checked. And it, yeah, your status will be updated. That's the whole idea of the C-surf kind of attacks. It's uh, pretty well known. So there are plenty of different uh, protec protections for that, um, which some of them we can uh, circumvent with, uh, with, uh, with course. Uh, yeah, sorry. So that's about C-surf. And uh, let's see the attack scenarios. The reason I explain C-surf is because we start with two different C-surf attacks. The multi-stage multi C-surf is, um, is a kind of attack where, you, where, you, where the process what you're trying to attack is multi-stage. Imagine a web shop. When you, when you go to a web shop, you first uh, choose the product and put it in your shopping basket. Then you go to the checkout, then you set the delivery, delivery address, and at the end, you just click on, uh, you, you make the payment and go home. So it's, uh, it's four steps. And, uh, and if you want to implement this as an attack in like different forms uh, and not using JavaScript, then it's pretty difficult because you have, to, you have to get the user to do different things and you have to send these requests in the, in the, in the right order. So it's, it's pretty complicated. But since course, you can use JavaScript. That's the whole idea that you can, when you have JavaScript, you can implement whatever you want. You can send requests in the whatever way you want to send them. So it makes uh, like a multi-stage uh, attack uh, much more easier because you can implement it in JavaScript. The file upload CSERF, uh, I will just skip it now because on the next slide I have, I have an example. Uh, Cross-domain data theft, one of the demo will be about that, is essentially there is a domain, you are the attacker, you don't have access to, the, to that domain, but you know a user who has. So somehow you want to go to the user and from there request the data from, from the target domain and, and uh, steal it or smuggle it out to you. That's the cross-domain data theft. Um, yeah, complex JavaScript attack scenarios. As I explained in the multi-stage uh, C-surf, um, with JavaScript, you can, you can essentially have a really strong tool uh, to, to do stuff uh, on the client side. And for instance, uh, probably you know the browser exploitation framework, the Beef. Um, it runs in JavaScript, and for instance, uh, with Beef, Beef also exploits uh, uh, cores. So, for instance, when when you have a with Beef, you have a, a compromised uh, target, so compromised uh, compromised user into the internal network. Then with Beef, you you look around and see a service you can attack, like uh, a web server or a SMTP server or something like that. Then you can exploit that with with Beef. You can you can open a backdoor there, and then Beef will will do the communication with the web door, so you're communicating from the browser to the exploited service, and this communication will be done uh, using course. Um, yeah, that's how, for instance, Beef uses course. And uh, yeah, network enumeration. There are tools on the internet, uh, what you can use to kind of nmap M -map the internet network from JavaScript. It's, uh, yeah, they are not so sophisticated because it, they usually use um, like, uh, um, measures on, based on delays 
So the response delays to decide whether a port is open, whether a, a, an IP, address, IP exists or something like that. So they're not really, um, not really sophisticated, but, but it's possible. And uh, yeah, the example. So the file upload C serve. Actually, I was, uh, I was doing a test. It was a pretty, pretty simple application. It, there was a login and the file upload form. That was the application. So obviously, I wanted to do some kind of malicious file upload because that's the only thing that I could do. So what I tried to do is, uh, so when you, when you use the normal file upload form of HTML, it will generate you uh, a multi-stage, uh, multi, multi part uh, request to upload your file. It's like, this is, this is the file, file part of the, this multi-part uh, request. And uh, it turned out for me that you can't fake this request with a normal HTML form. So normally you can fake requests with, no, with HTML forms, so the normal uh, forms, but you can't do the same request as the, as the file upload uh, HTML form because of this, this innocent parameter here, this file name parameter. You can't really, you can't really put this in a normal form because, because you just don't have the tools um, in HTML to do that, uh, or at least I couldn't. So yeah, if you know a solution, let me know. But, uh, and that was the time when I found out that course existed because it, with course it gets, uh, gets much easier. Uh, this, is a, this is an HTML page and uh, this, is, this is to exploit this file upload c -surf. This means that when the user visits this page, uh, he, will see, he will see a submit button. Actually, it's not necessary to have a submit button, but it was a proof of concept. He will see a submit button and when he clicks on the submit button, this JavaScript code will, uh, will upload a file to the server. And since it's JavaScript, you can do whatever you want. So you can, you can put here this file name thingy, what was not possible with the normal form. Actually, it was funny because when I find this, first I implemented it by myself, and it turned out that the next day, uh, Portswigger really is a new version of the Burp Suite, and they implemented just the same thing that you can generate this proof of concept, co concept code. So this one is actually generated with, uh, uh, with Burp. Just I, I changed it a little bit. Uh, yeah, so here, essentially, Cores allows you to, to upload files uh, in a, in a C-Surf vulnerable web service or a web application. That was the main point. And um, as I mentioned already, uh, course is not broken, so uh, it has pretty strong limitations. You can't, you can't always use it in a way that you want uh, because actually it was designed more or less with security in mind, so there are like stuff about that in the specification. But, um, so you have to know these limitations. Uh, one which I called the write-only request. Uh, what happens here is that the, the browser has the right to decide whether it shows you the response or not. So you, you send an XML, XML HTTP request, uh, it goes to the server, the server executes the actions what you wanted, sends back the response, and the browser gets the response, and he can decide, he can make this decision whether you can see this response or not. When I say see, it means that from JavaScript, if, you, if the browser doesn't allow it, from JavaScript you can't, uh, can't read the response object properly. You won't see the contents. Uh, even in Firebug, for instance, you won't see the contents of the response. And uh, the whole idea was here, is that to give the server the ability to do like, he can say that, yeah, I do what you asked for, but actually, if you don't comply with these things, then you shouldn't see the response. This is a, it's a bit weird for me why this idea came, but that's how it works. And uh, these, are, these are the cases when, when this happens. So for instance, the response uh, should always have a, an, an access control allow origins header uh, to tell the browser that, that your, uh, your origin is allowed, so your domain is allowed. If this header 
it, it is not in the response, then the browser will not show the response. When, the, when this header is not in the response, that essentially means that course is not turned off on the server side. So, yeah. Uh, the second case is if, uh, if there is this access control allow origins header, but the, the origin where, where you are is not defined there. That means essentially that, that the server says that, okay, I give you the response, but this response is only for this and this and this origin. And if you're you not in that, then, uh, then the browser will not show you the response. And uh, there is a tricky one, which was also uh, surprising for me. Uh, here, this ACAO is the access control LO origin again. And you can define it with the, with the LO all, so this uh, star. And, um, and with that, you're saying that I, enab I, I, I enable course and I, I allow it for everybody. So you can come from any origins, you can have my stuff. And uh, the funny thing is that now in JavaScript, uh, in XML HTTP request, you can say that, you can tell the browser that, please attach my cookies, uh, attach the proper cookies to this request. This is the with credentials uh, property of the XML HTTP request object. So you can say with, with credentials equals true, and then the browser will see, okay, then I have, I have cookies here, I will just attach them. But if the, if the response comes with, the, with this allow all access control allow origins, then, then the browser will not show you the, re the response again. It's just, I think it's just a measure to say that if the server, server is not configured properly because it, it allows everything, then, then at least we shouldn't do stuff with credentials. I think that's the essential point of it. And actually, it's, it's from defense point of view, it makes sense. So I tried, I had, I had attacks where this was my problem, that I couldn't do my attack. And uh, one last thing, uh, this, the requests are sent. So the requests always go to the server. It will be executed there, and it comes back, even if you can't see the response at the end. The thing what you asked for will happen at the server side, but you just can't read the response. Another limitation is uh, what I already explained, when the pre fight request fails. That means that you define the not simple request, the browser, browser sends um, an options uh, request, a pre fight request, the, the server responds, and it turns out that you're not allowed to do th that what you wanted then the browser will just drop your request and that's it. So until now, what I, what, what I, what I said, so we're talking about course and um, it's to access other domains from JavaScript. Uh, we defined the attacker model. We sh I showed some scenarios, some attack scenarios, and to be a bit constructive, um, uh, I will just give some ideas for solutions. The first one is to, to let people understand course, and uh, that's what I'm trying to do right now, to, to explain, because if, you, if you're developers or, or admins or, or things like that, uh, you will probably want, probably want to know about this stuff, because it might affect your, your service or your application. Then, yeah, as always, you should be as strict as you can, uh, strict with the origins. Think about whether you, at whether you at all want to support something like that. If it doesn't make sense for your application, just don't use it, turn it off, reject it. You also shouldn't allow credentials if you don't want. So um, if, if, there, if there's no business call for that, then, then don't allow people coming to you from, from JavaScript with, uh, with uh, credentials or uh, session cookies. And there is a little bit of uh, change of mindset here because, uh, because now it's also the developer's problem. And uh, it's because of this. Uh, if you want to do hardening, uh, you can do now it, it in various levels on the web server or container or whatever where, where your application runs. Or you can do it in the application itself, so in the, in the application code. For the web server level, a really simple example is the Apache HTTPD. You can just simply use the uh, mod headers module. Uh, 
defined under the config or in the htaccess files and, and set the header, set the, set the access control URL origin header uh, as, stri as st strictly as you can. There is a, there is a website called enablecores.org or something like that. And uh, there are a few examples how you can turn it on. And actually it's a nice website because it explains a lot. But I, I, I think it's a bit stupid that, that enabling cores is, the, the suggestion is to set it to, to allow all, so to the, to the star. And yeah, I think it's a bit stupid that that's the basic suggestion. But yeah, it's not my website. And the other, uh, other level, the application level, uh, I'm not a developer, so probably there are other very sophisticated ways. But the point is, you can set the headers from the application code as well, depending on the, on the business logic of your application. So wherever, whenever you want to allow uh, to, the course to, to function, you can set it, uh, you can allow it, and the other part of the business logic or your application, you can just reject su such things. But the interesting part, part here is now developers also need to think, the, think, think about these things. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't say thank you yet, because I still have 12 minutes, and I have demos as well. Uh, I have to be honest with you, I'm not that brave to do live demos. So I recorded the demos uh, uh, in videos and I will just explain them right now. Uh, yeah, so the first one is, uh, is with the Sugar C CRM. It's a, it's a half open source, half commercial uh, CRM application, but you, yeah, you can go to the internet and you can test it just uh, on their website. And um, yeah, and th that's, that, was a, that was an application which I, I tried to, to, to find something to use course. And it was pretty, inter pretty interesting. So let's see what's happening here. So in Chrome, in this browser, we are logged in as Jane and Jane is a regular user. I don't know whether you can read it or not. And in Firefox, we are logged in as the admin and looking at Jane's profile, still regular user. <coughs> what our goal is to, uh, to escalate Jane to system admin user. And uh, here you can, at the bottom, you can see that there is, a, there is a, a cookie, a session cookie. And the funny part was, I didn't understand it first, that this cookie expires in 60 seconds. So it's all, only valid for 60 seconds. I don't know why they do that. But uh, it's some kind of protection against CSERF because, because if the website is just open in your browser and you're doing a CSERF attack, then you have just 60, 60 seconds to do that. Otherwise, the cookie will expire and the, the, the browser will not attach it to your, to your request when you're doing the CSERF. So you can see it here that this cookie is actually already expired. And uh, yeah. Let's see what we are going to do. I have a little JavaScript here. Uh, it's, it's pretty long, but only because it's, this is a request to change your profile. And you can change a lot of stuff, that's why it's so long. But the important part here is uh, at the beginning, because what happens, it's, I really don't understand why, but since your cookie expires in every 60 seconds, when you do something on a website, you get another cookie. You don't have to authenticate again. You just get the same cookie back, for, again, for 60 seconds. It's totally weird, um, but it helps a lot in this attack. So that's why it's actually vulnerable. Because, yeah, it's, a, it's the same cookie. So it's not even a new cookie. But for this attack, it doesn't matter, but it's the same cookie. So it's not like a firewall. When the user is not active, Yeah, something like that. But yeah. As you will see, it's, it's not working good. Um, so what I'm, I'm going to do here, this first part, of, first part of, the, of the script is actually just sends a GET request to the, to the service without credentials, without anything. Just sends a GET request. And just the reason is to get back, the, get back a, a cookie. So to make sure that there is a, there is a valid cookie. So after this, six, after this, uh, this GET request, you will have 60 seconds to do your attack because there will be a cookie there for 60 seconds. 
And as I, as I talked about the write-only request, uh, it's really good because in this case, it doesn't matter whether you can read the response or not, because the, because the browser will automatically set the new cookie. You don't have to do anything with the response. You just send the get, and the browser will do the rest. And after this, after this, I will send my, my yeah, malicious, uh, malicious request. It's a simple post request to change this. Uh, yeah, I think you don't see it pretty well. It's the isAdmin uh, attribute of the profile request. And I set isAdmin to one. That's, that's the trick. Uh, yeah. Now I just do stuff. And let's see how that happens. So I have this website. Uh, you can see here that it runs localhost. Uh, important here, it's, it's not that it's localhost, it's that it's in another domain. So it's, it's not in the, uh, in the target domain, it's in another domain. And uh, I have to trick the user, of course, the admin in this case, to come here and open my URL. When he opens it in this case, click on the button, but it's not necessary. When he clicks on the button, you can see at the bottom that first our GET request is sent to get the cookie. And a few seconds later, the POST request is sent to set, set us uh, to admin privileges. And uh, the, the cookie is in the response that's in burp. So if you, if you look at the GET, in the request, there, is no, there are no credentials at all, no cookies, nothing. It's just a simple GET request but you still get back the cookie for 60 seconds. And because of that, the post request is, uh, I was pretty confused when I recorded this stuff. Uh, the post request will have a wallet cookie, as you can see there. And, uh, and you can see that it has the is admin set to one. The response is not too interesting, it's just a redirect, but at least something happens, so it's not an error message or something like that. But if we go back to the browser, first this is the, the session of the admin user. I will just uh, go to edit mode, to, just to reload the page, essentially. And ta-da, you can see that, that Jane is now system administrator. Uh, but the better part is if we go to the other browser, uh, to Jane's pro, uh, session, and we reload the page, Jane can already see that she's, an, she's a system administrator now. So what happened here, uh, the important part was here that we could use course to do the request from JavaScript and, and to circumvent this funny protection of the, of the cookie timeout. Uh, that, was, that was our goal. And this allowed us to, to do privilege escalation for Jane in the admins session. So that was one example. And uh, I have another one. I've chosen a wiki because I think every company has a wiki, an internal wiki, where people have pretty confidential information on the page. Uh, usually these wikis are not require authentication to, to read the stuff what is on. You only need to log in if you want to change something. But in this case, I don't want to change anything. My only goal is to, to steal the secret, uh, super secret plan uh, from the internal wiki. I'm an external attacker. I don't have access to the, to the internal systems, but I know that there is a, there is a super secret plan uh, on the internal wiki, and my goal is to, to smuggle it out. Um, and that's what we are gonna do here. You can see this is our domain, uh, this IP address. And this is the super secret plan URL. As the attacker, I, I already know that uh, because that's how I, I build my exploit. So probably I'm like an ex-employee or something. Uh, and yeah, I just want to smuggle the stuff out because they fired me, bastards. Um, and here is a JavaScript, thank you. Here is a, the JavaScript code. It has two parts. The first part is to, to actually download, download the super secret plan to the client, to the browser. As you can see there, I, um, I, call, this, I call this request, uh, this, uh, this uh, request URL 
uh, function with the URL of the super secret plan. And uh, that means that I download the stuff to the browser. And uh, then the second part of the, uh, of the attack is to send back this, uh, send this, this uh, uh, wiki site to my uh, homepage, to my domain. So that's how I'm sm smuggling it out from the internal network because my domain runs on the internet. Um, yeah, no attacker should use this script because it's like vulnerable for everything, probably. Uh, but what it does when a post request comes in, it will just write the content of the post request in a file, just that we can see, um, we can load it in a browser. Uh, that runs in the attacker's domain, this script. Yeah, so there is, a, there is a website. Again, it's on the internet. Here it's localhost, but let's imagine that it's on the internet. And you can see it's a totally innocent website. It's for My Little Pony fans, because we know that the target user is a My Little Pony fan. So he or she comes here. And uh, yeah, just for the introduction, you had to scroll over the picture, and something happened. What happened here, as you can see, that first there was a request, a GET request to download the plan, and then a POST request to send it to, to the attacker's page. If you look at it in Burp, we can see here there is the GET request. Again, no problem with it because, because it's a simple request and it has no credentials at all. And in the response, one important thing is that course is enabled. So it's enabled for all. So that's uh, that's a problem here. You could you could avoid this stuff by configuring it well, configuring configuring it well. And uh, and now you have the whole uh, whole wiki website uh, in the response or like this web page. And now we go and send the a post request to to the attacker's domain, and in the content it's it's the same HTML code from the wiki uh, in URL encoding. Yeah, re response is not really interesting. It was accepted. Now let's see whether it worked. If you go there, you can just load. If you remember, the incoming HTML was the place, was the file where I wrote the, 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 the wiki page. So we can load the incoming HTML. And ta -da, uh, it's there. So the fact is that, that I could smuggle out an internal wiki site and put it on my, put it on my, my, uh, my website or my server on the internet. So that was our goal. goal. And uh, this was possible because course was not configured pro properly, because I could just, just send XML HTTP requests to other domains. Um, yeah, that's that. And uh, that was more or less it. So uh, do you have any questions? Uh, I can tell you in, in version numbers, but, uh, but Firefox, uh, Chrome, and Internet Explorer has just an Internet Explorer, the XML HTTP request is defined in another way, so the object is called in another way, but they all have uh, since, since HTML5. So it's, it's a totally normal HTML5 feature, so all browsers who support HTML5 will support this one. Yep? Sorry? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so he was saying that Internet Explorer supports it partially. So, yeah, I didn't really use Internet Explorer, so that's why I didn't really go into the topic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions? No, then thank you very much that you were here, and yeah, have fun for the weekend.
Ladies and gents, Gergay Rive.